You're watching Lit Sports Online. We're talking UFC 235 Jones versus Smith preview episode here. And there's a lot of fights we want to go over, actually. We're actually going to start with some of these prelims. Uh, we got Diego Sanchez versus Mickey Gall for a welterweight bout. What do you think? I just wanted to bring this one up because Diego Sanchez is a huge fan favorite, and he's been in the UFC for an insane amount of time. Like, when he debuted, if, if he had a kid when he debuted in the UFC, that kid would be in high school right now. Dude started in the UFC in 2005. And he was the first winner of the Ultimate Fighter reality television show. Just crazy to me that he's still out here with his crazy self just fighting. But, nonetheless, he just loves a brawl. He's constantly forward motion, just constantly throwing bombs. Every fight that he has is entertaining. Every fight that he has is just dirty and ugly. And Mickey Gall, I think this is a huge test for him. He's going against a guy that, like I said, is just constant forward pressure with a lot of power. And this is really going to tell where Mickey Gall is going. You know, it's Mickey Gall has been up and coming for a little while. He's had his ups and downs. And he, he debuted in the, the fight against CM Punk, submitted him in the first round. He beat Sage Northcutt. So it's a good test for Mickey Gall. A fun fight for Diego Sanchez because Mickey Gall is similar to him. He loves to brawl, and it should be entertaining. And I think that we're going to either see Diego Sanchez, who knows when he's going to retire, but either we're going to see him take a nasty loss and Mickey Gall move forward in his career, or we're going to see Mickey Gall real upset about the fact that he lost to somebody at the bottom end of the division. Moving on to our next bout, we've got... Uh, on the prelims, we got Misha Serkinov versus Johnny Walker for a light heavyweight bout. So this is exciting because it's two up-and-comers in the light heavyweight division, which is a division that is, as I said in another video, relatively boring for the most part because of the fact that the top end is so dominant. You know, Daniel Cormier and John Jones, barely anybody's touching them. But we have these two guys up and coming. We have Serkinov, who's a, a, a phenomenal submission grappler, and Johnny Walker, who just has crazy power. So I think that it, it's a dangerous fight for both guys. If if Johnny Walker is able to keep it standing at range, I think he stands a good chance to land that big shot. But if Serkinov is able to close the distance, he can land some shots of his own. And if he takes it to the ground, he's probably going to walk away with another submission victory. So it'll be a good fight to move one of the guys towards the top of the division and push a little bit more life into that stagnant division. Well, and it's always interesting when you see a fight where it's like, what, you know, one guy wants to take it to the ground ideally and the other guy ideally wants to be standing up during the fight. Yeah. Seem like one of those? I think so. And we're going to see that theme come up a little bit later with one of the main event fights. But yeah, those fights are always interesting because it's, it basically comes down to who has better wrestling, who who has the better takedowns or takedown defense. So it's it's you know the fight is going to be won or lost in that dirty boxing clinching range, and so it's you know high stakes, high pressure, and a lot of anticipation when they do start to get close and go for that uh, that takedown. The next prelim we got Jeremy Stevens versus Zabit Nagomed Shapirov. Did I say that right? Magomed Sharipov, but very close. <laughs> very close. Not an easy one to say. Yeah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a theme that we've seen before, and a highly touted up-and-comer versus a, a grizzled veteran. You know, Jeremy Stevens is a guy that's been around in multiple divisions as high as welterweight of 170 down to where he's currently fighting at bantamweight of 145, I think where he is or 135 doesn't matter gonna be a fun fight though we got jeremy stevens who is i like to say he's like a, a technical brawler he, he can strike very technically and very you know c traditionally correct or he can throw giant power punches but everything he throws is with bad intentions and if he lands a big shot the other guy's going down versus zabit magomed sharipov who trains with Frankie Edgar, Eddie Alvarez, used to train with Edson Barboza, under Mark Henry in New Jersey, and is just phenomenal. Uh, to hear them say it, he is 
just an incredible talent. They've never seen anything like it. And that's coming from two former UFC champions in Frankie Edgar and Eddie Alvarez and a coach who has trained multiple UFC champions and title challengers and Mark Henry. So he's got a, a very varied game, throws a lot of creative strikes, is able to strike from range, is able to get takedowns, is able to dirty box. And it's a a very, very dangerous bout for Stevens, who is kind of in the past few years been a perennial contender always towards the top and a, a very, very scary bout for uh, Magomed Sharipov in the sense that this, it's the, the most high pressure he's had. It's a huge name. It's a guy towards the top of the division. So if he wins this, he's going to be start being talked about in the title contention. And if he loses, he still has that possibility. He's just got it's a setback for a year or two. He's got to go through some more guys. So high pressure fight for both guys, but should be entertaining nonetheless. Moving on to our main card now, we got Cody. Garbrandt versus Pedro Munoz and I mean what would you tell us about this one so this is uh, again kind of uh, an up and comer versus a guy who's been around for a little while uh, Garbrandt is a former former title holder he beat Dominic Cruz in one of the most impressive performances I've ever seen uh, Dominic Cruz is a guy who's one of the greatest bantamweights of all time his footwork is crazy his He's just a phenomenal fighter, and he's he's a very cerebral, intelligent fighter. And Garbrandt went out and just took Dominic Cruz apart. It was it was a phenomenal thing to watch. Uh, unfortunately, he went on and lost twice to T.J. Dillashaw, a former teammate, and some very you know heated fights, very emotionally charged, which I think is part of the reason he lost. But it's Garbrandt is a a well-known veteran with phenomenal striking, good, good, good wrestling versus, like we said earlier, Pedro Munoz. It's another kind of guy with a lot of submissions versus a guy with a lot of uh, stand-up finishes. So, I think Pedro Munoz does have the ability to stand with Garbrandt, but I think that his best route is to get it down and get the submission on Garbrandt. I think if he stays standing with Garbrandt for too long, Garbrandt's too fast. His footwork is too good, and he's got too much power in his hands. So I think that if it stays standing, it's Garbrandt's fight. If it goes to the ground, it's Munoz's fight. But either way, we're going to see one guy one step away from a title shot after this fight. Both guys are on that cusp. You know, Munoz coming up for the first time, and Garbrandt kind of sticking around that top after losing the title. All right, and then also on the main card... Interesting bout here. We got Tisha Torres against Weili Zhang. Uh, two women going at in a fight here. Yeah, and again, this is two two women towards the top of the division. Tisha Torres is always right near the top. Uh, unfortunately, right now she's on a two-fight losing streak, but she's lost to the next challenger for the title, <clears throat> who earned the title shot after beating her and Jessica Andraj, who's going to fight Rez Namajunas. And her next loss was to former title holder Yoni and Jacek, who just fought for the title a weight class up. So Tisha's only got losses to the best of the best in the division and is a phenomenal fighter. She's very well-rounded. She has a very interesting style. She's able to move in and out really quickly. Uh, she kind of stays more centered and uses almost a karate stance, which is why, why her... Um, kind of dis distance management is so good because she she has this style where she's able to kind of leap in quicker than you know a boxer who has to kind of plot in and take a couple steps but she's fighting Wei Li Zhang who's just a, a highly touted prospect she's a newcomer to the UFC she's only had I think two fights in the UFC but she only has one loss in her career so this is really kind of uh, similar to the the last fight this is uh, similar to the Magomed Sharipov and Jeremy Stevens fight, this is this is really the fight that's going to tell where she's at in her career. Is she ready to take on that top of the division, or does she need a couple more fights to get a little more experience, improve a little bit more, and then move towards the top in title contention? Next, we've got ruthless Robbie Lawler against Ben Askren. To this is one of my most anticipated fights 
in a while. Robbie Lawler is one of my favorites. Just, I mean, his nickname is Ruthless for a reason. He is just a a buzzsaw of violence. Like, watch his fight with Rory McDonald and how battered and destroyed both those guys are at the end of that fight, and you'll understand his nickname. Watch him. I mean, he has early finishes, long, drawn-out brawls. Dude came out with his lips split halfway up his face and just no shits given. Versus Ben Askren, who is <clears throat> the most highly touted fighter outside the UFC in a long time. He won titles in Bellator and the World Series of Fighting, defended multiple times each one, trains with Tyron Woodley out of uh, the fight camp out there in Ohio under Duke Rufus, and is he has Olympic-level experience in wrestling and is just one of the most impressive grapplers out there. I, I, I'd put... I'd say he's similar to Khabib Nurmagomedov in that he's one of those guys who his striking is not top tier, but his striking serves to get him into the position he wants to be in, which is he wants to grab you, he wants to drag you down, and he wants to just put you through the wood chipper. Just, uh, just ride it out on the ground, just smother you, constant ground and pound, and just destroy you with his wrestling. It's it's phenomenal to watch. But how's Askren done so far as he's come to the UFC, or is this his debut? This is his debut, actually. And they did him zero favors by giving him Robbie Lawler, a former welterweight champ. It's not an easy fight by any means. And and I think this is, this is the fight that I was talking about earlier when I said that that striker versus grappler uh, matchup is going to come back. This is the epitome of the striker versus grappler. This is a gritty well-rounded power striker in Robbie Lawler who has made most of his career has been focused on takedown defense getting back up off the ground and just brawling with people and throwing the heaviest shots he possibly can and constantly moving forward versus a Ben Askren who <clears throat> similar constantly moving forward but his goal is to grab you to take you down and to hold you there and punish you as much as he can so it's like I said striker versus grappler match I don't know who's going to win because Robbie Lawler has phenomenal takedown defense. But I have a feeling if Ben Askren gets his hands on him, Robbie's going down. But if Robbie's able to keep it up, Ben Askren's in for a long night, just as Robbie is if Ben Askren takes it down. One way or the other, one guy's going to have a real bad time. Interesting to see how that one's going to play out. Of course, we've got a welterweight title fight on this card with Tyron Woodley defending against Kamaru Usman. We do. <clears throat> Tyron Woodley, teammate of Ben Askren. Tyron Woodley, who actually holds a win over Ben Askren's opponent, Robbie Lawler, so there's a leg up for Ben Askren there. But Tyron Woodley versus Kamaru Usman is a fight that's kind of been building for a while. Usman's been calling for the title shot, and the welterweight title picture is a little weird because they, they had the interim title in Colby Covington versus... Rafael Dos Anjos, where Covington won and got the interim title and then was stripped of the title because he had an elective surgery and wouldn't be able to fight for nine months to a year, so they stripped him of the interim title even though he was promised it, and then Usman was calling for a title even when Covington was the interim title, and they kind of, it's been a whole mess. But here we are. No interim title holder currently, and Kamara Usman is challenging Tyron Woodley for the undisputed belt. In a really interesting matchup, I think that <clears throat> both guys are incredibly well-rounded. I think that Usman has a slight edge in wrestling, and Woodley has a decent edge in striking. I think that Woodley, the, the, the power difference between Woodley's strikes and Usman's strikes is pretty pronounced. I think Woodley, I mean, we've seen it in a lot of his fights and most of his fights where he just has that ability to land uncork that one big right hand and just completely shut down the opponent he, he knocked out Robbie Lawler in the first round we saw him land a huge shot on Darren Till and put him down and submit him after that we've seen him knock out tons of guys and very few people can stand up to that power but in Usman 
you're dealing with <clears throat> a guy who is it's his confidence and his pressure and the pace that he puts on that win him fights. He doesn't have knockout power, but he has phenomenal wrestling, really good ground control, and and a, a tenacious pace that he puts on. He is constantly moving forward, never lets the other guy breathe. He's constantly throwing strikes, constantly level changing, constantly going for takedowns. Once he has you on the ground, he's constantly throwing shots and advancing for position. So I think what it comes down to is Usman's confidence and pressure versus Tyron Woodley's counter-striking and, and, and wrestling. I think Woodley has phenomenal takedowns, as good as anyone, including Usman. But I don't think that Usman is going to be able to keep him down. I think that I think Usman will be able to get a takedown or two, but I don't think he'll be able to hold Woodley down and punish him and smother him like he wants to. I think that Woodley will be able to get back up, and I think it's a question of whether whether Usman is able to make this a dirty fight or whether Woodley is able to use enough kicks and punches to keep it at distance long enough to land that giant shot. Because if he lands that giant shot, it's 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 game over. Moving on to the main event, light heavyweight title fight, John Jones versus Anthony Smith. Two of the guys top of the light heavyweight division going at it here. And, uh, well, I'd have to think that John Jones is the favorite, but I don't know. I mean, what, what, how do you see this one? John Jones is a huge favorite. <clears throat> He's like a negative 850 or something. It's disrespectful to Anthony Smith <laughs> how big of a favorite John Jones is. Almost rightfully so, I would say, but Smith has been saying a lot about how most of the media is counting him out and everything, and I mean, I understand why. You know, he's he's a middleweight who came up after not wanting to cut weight anymore. He has three fights at light heavyweight, three finishes at light heavyweight, two of which are former title holders, Rashad Evans, Shogun Hua, holds knockouts of both of those gentlemen in a combined two minutes and 22 seconds. <clears throat> that's incredibly impressive. Two title holders on his resume in less than two and a half minutes. Both of the tail ends of their career, for sure. But Shogun, we've seen come back and look a lot better than he had in a long time since that fight. Then Anthony Smith went on to fight Volkan Uzdemir in a fight that he was winning pretty much the whole time. He did get taken down by Uzdemir a couple times. Uzdemir took his back. But Smith was never really in any trouble, and he was able to go on and submit Volkan Uzdemir in the third round. So he beat a recent title contender in the, in the division. But like I said earlier, this light heavyweight division is not the most exciting because of just the top of the division. John Jones is most likely the greatest, best fighter We've ever seen in the UFC. Not greatest, best. Greatest, maybe not, because all these blemishes that he has, he can't not be a shithead outside of the octagon and not fail drug tests. I don't... In the entire roster of 500 guys, we have never seen anybody have as many problems with drug tests as he has. But, since he hasn't failed any drug tests recently, we won't harp on that. So... The, the the distance between the rest of the division and your John Jones and your Daniel Cormier, I think, is, is pretty big. And Anthony Smith is a, is a pretty big underdog, I think. So why isn't it Cormier fighting uh, Jones? Well, Cormier recently won the heavyweight title after beating Stipe Miocic. And John Jones then came back and won the undisputed title by beating <clears throat> Alexander Gustafsson in a rematch of what was the closest fight of his career. And Cormier vacated the light heavyweight title. <clears throat> I don't think Cormier is planning on coming back down to light heavyweight, but he hasn't officially said that, so he's still listed in the rankings there, even though he's the heavyweight champ. My guess is, if anything, we see Jones-Cormier 3 at heavyweight. <coughs> but there's not much call for a Jones-Cormier fight, because Jones beat Cormier twice. They fought twice, and Jones won twice. I mean, 
typically you only see that third fight if they split the first two, right? There's, right. What else does John Jones have to prove against Daniel Cormier? He beat him in a decision the first time. It was close, but it wasn't. Nobody was mad that Cormier didn't get the decision. You know, it was as close as a John Jones fight's going to get, with the exception of Alexander Gustafsson won. But the second time he went out and finished him. I mean, he landed a, a giant head kick on him and TKO'd him after that. What, what? Why? Why would John Jones fight him a third time? There's no benefit there for John Jones. It's only a benefit for Daniel Cormier. So we're seeing. Anthony Smith come up from middleweight, get a bunch of huge wins, and now he's fighting for the title. And I think the big, the big thing for Anthony Smith is, is the mental game. I think that he is, he's one of the most calm fighters I've ever seen. He's just completely focused, completely cool-headed. Nothing seems to phase him. He's had over seventy fights between his amateur and professional career, and that's not including, you know him getting into backyard brawls when he was a kid. So this guy has a a ton of experience. And I think that that's, that's where his best chance comes from, is his experience, his ability to stay calm in any situation. He's seen it all. He's got 13, 14 losses on his record. He's been on the wrong end of bad situations enough times that he can be there and not lose his cool and lose his head and <clears throat> make poor, make bad decisions. He also has a ton of power. We see him land huge shots and knock guys out cold. So I think that <clears throat> if he's able to just constantly move forward, try to disrupt John's flow, and put that pressure on him, He's he, that's his best bet, you know. I, I think that he's he's a guy who we see him get these crazy finishes in in that he lands a single a shot that throws a guy off for a second, and then he has these these crazy sprints forward where he just he lands that first shot, senses that the other guy's in a tiny bit of danger, and then just runs at the other guy and completely rushes and overwhelms guys. And he he does it with kick with punches, heavy shots, and then he'll throw a kick to keep a guy in the center line to stop him from cutting out in the corner against the cage. And I think that's his best shot is, is is swarming and overwhelming Jones and landing that big shot. That being said, I don't, you know, more than likely, John Jones is going to do what John Jones does and put on an incredibly dominant <clears throat> and proficient performance and win in a one-sided fashion. I mean, he, he certainly has the ability to, the technical ability. He's, his striking is great. He has a much longer reach. He has great kicks, both leg kicks, body kicks, and head kicks. Um, his, he, he, he can dirty box in close range, as we saw against Glover Teixeira. He can throw giant elbows in close range, as we saw against Rashad Evans. He can strike at range, as we saw against Alexander Gustafsson. He can wrestle, as we saw against Daniel Cormier and everybody else. He took down an Olympic wrestler in Daniel Cormier. John Jones doesn't have any holes that you can really point out. No glaring shortcomings or anything, with maybe the exception of his mindset. Maybe he's a little too cocky, but... That's what we saw happen in the first Gustafson fight. We saw a guy who many people didn't think was going to be able to challenge him, and John Jones didn't take him seriously and came into the fight underprepared, and it was the closest fight of his career, but he still won. I don't think he's going to make that mistake against Anthony Smith, especially seeing how much power Smith has got in his punches, his elbows, and his knees. And I, I Well, you, you know, the reality is some of the best <clears throat> professional fighters I, I can think of are cocky assholes, you know? I mean, that's yeah. that's some guy, that's just their style. There's other guys that they're just, you know, I'm, I'm focused at the task at hand, you know? And, mm -hmm. like, that's how they roll. So, um, you know, I don't know that I would read too much into that, but, you know, uh, you know, this whole thing with the drug tests for John Jones, you know, obviously that, that could be a potential blemish on the career, but yeah, in terms of this fight, I, I think you summed it up pretty well. And so I guess Anthony Smith's the underdog, but every dog has his day, so we'll see. Yeah, he's a huge underdog, but I'll tell you what, I'm gonna put ten bucks on him this weekend. He lands that big shot. John Jones goes down, making a bunch of money, man. Everybody's got a puncher's chance. Nobody more than a dude who has one shot power and every limb he throws. And Anthony Smith. 
So there you go. A little betting advice to close on, perhaps. But uh, <laughs> probably lose ten bucks. But if you if you win, you win big. Yeah, get the get those odds. Uh, and pump up your your potential prize. But anyways, that's gonna do it for this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like the video, subscribe to LitTube, and also check out our website. This is LitTube.com. Link in the description. We'll see you there. Oh, are you still running for governor? Who? Yeah. That was oh. your idea. Oh, yeah. That's You're right. running for governor? <laughs> I don't think so. No, that was me. <laughs> Fuck, I, I wanted to run for state delegate. <laughs> I don't pay that close attention. I feel like I'd be I'd more likely just like be your campaign manager. That's fucking awesome, dude. Who the fuck's gonna want to vote for you me? You can make sure my taxes are in order. <laughs>